Uh, well, here we're going to go for some pianistic science. QM is a magic. <clears throat> Planck's constant. All right. Now, some of the things, the properties of quantum mechanics that we argue about that people make magical, uh, they do exist. They're parts of quantum mechanics. Entanglement, uh, coherence, the superposition, tunneling, all very interesting things. We'll get to them. I think I can show that these are not magic as well. Uh, should be uh, pretty uh, straightforward insofar as nothing's magic. But, you know... Uh, Newton's laws are not magic, but, you know, they might enable you to create an airplane, but that turns out not to be magic either. So let's talk about quantum mechanics. It's just chemistry. Well, let's talk about quantized energy. All right. Quantized energy. This dude. Who's that? Max Planck, or I mean, I just said the Planck constant, the Planckity Planck constant, Planck or Planck, however you like to go. He was studying a little thing we like to call black body radiation. Here's a little, here's a little chart for you of intensity versus uh, the wavelength of light, where each of the colored curves uh, corresponds to some temperature. So if the temperature is 5,000 degrees Kelvin, you got the green line. Uh, peaks somewhere in the optical wavelengths uh, and so on. You got this pattern. They were trying to explain it. <clears throat> well, Planck decided that he would uh, he would model um, he would model whatever's producing it, whatever's radiating the energy as a harmonic oscillators vibrating at the frequency of the radiated uh, energy. So this is a little model, you know, it's not what it's supposed to look like in the uh, black body. Uh. Oh, and by the way, uh, I've talked about black bodies before, but you know, it's um, sort of an idealized thing and yet uh, real, lots of real objects act pretty much like black bodies. Everything uh, is approximately acting like a black body. Um, but a hot rock that's in equilibrium, it'll It'll radiate a steady light based on its temperature. Okay, so he's like, he's trying to generate these, these curves, and um, and also look at the curves experimentally, really in detail, which we'll get into. And he's doing it by saying, okay, well, there's a system of harmonic oscillators, a little mathematical trip or trick. Well. He comes up with Planck's relation, which is energy equals a constant h times the frequency, uh, which isn't v, but a little Greek v thing. Okay, and this makes sense. Think about it. Okay, this means that the, that the frequency, the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. Okay, what's the frequency? Well, the frequency is how quick the thing's bouncing up and down. So if it's bouncing up and down really, really quick. Uh, all other things being equal, there's going to be more energy than if it's bouncing really slow. All right, and then Planck got stuck with his statistic with his analysis, and he just decided to do a statistical analysis trick, and he interpreted the vibrational energy of the oscillators not as continuous but as a discrete quantity. Okay, composed of an integral number of final equal parts. All right, so e equals hv. That means that v is going to be a whole number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That sort of thing. Okay, and he did it um, just to make the math work out. He said it was an act of despair, a purely formal assumption, and he didn't think there was a, any material reality to it necessarily. However. It turned out that he got a much better model of the spectra this way. Right now, this constant uh, h is just e over v. It's a ratio of the energy to the frequency. But it turns out to be this lowest amount of energy because um, if the frequency is, is 1, 
because now it can't be a fractional number. Uh, so you have this lowest amount, one, of zero is lower, but then there's no energy. So the lowest possible amount of extant energy uh, when V equals one, you know, if we use the magic convenient units, then uh, E is going to equal H. All right. Well, come along 1905, Einstein um, got into the business, and he, uh, working as a patent clerk at the time, where most of his great science seems to have come from, he solved this problem of the ultraviolet catastrophe. Now, the ultraviolet catastrophe is that in classical physics at the time, um, there was a prediction that a black body at thermal equilibrium will emit radiation with infinite power. So, oops, they knew that wasn't, wasn't right. So Einstein demonstrated that um, um, uh, classical electromagnetism, where you had continuous energy partitioning, you know, any amount of energy. Um, in other words, not like anything besides Planck's system. Uh, that no such system, continuous system, could ever account for the observed spectrum. Okay. So this is taken to um, apply to the question of was it just math? Because Planck thought that the whole, um, his constant was just a math trick at first. He thought that light, the fact that light was always emitted in these quanta was probably due to some systematic feature that regulated the emission. It is, but there's also more fundamental truth to it. It was actually Einstein that established that the quanta was a physical thing um, and that light was made of particles quantized in multiples of Planck's constant. Okay, solving the ultraviolet catastrophe went in that direction, but there's also uh, uh, some other stuff that I'll get to in a second, the photoelectric event, effect. But meanwhile, all hell is about to break loose because if E is quantized and E equals MC squared, the mass is quantized. If you follow the math and all the classical equations, there's a ripple effect. All kinds of things become quantized. Uh, I put in yellow down there that energy particles do. It's not necessarily obvious that it has to be this way. Uh, just because the amount of energy uh, is, is quantized um, does it really mean that you're going to have, you know, that there's this indiscreet amounts does it mean that you're going to have uh, energy in a particle? Um, it actually does end up meaning that. All right. Now, the photoelectric effect. Same time, Einstein was getting into the photoelectric effect, which had been discovered before that if you shine light on certain metals, uh, you kick off electrons. Now, the weird thing about it is when you shoot a bullet fa uh, faster and faster at something, say with more gunpowder, the pieces, the bits that come off the thing you're shooting come off faster and faster with more kinetic energy. But when you fire uh, more and more photons, more intense light at a surface, instead of getting faster electrons with higher kinetic energy, you just get more electrons at the same old kinetic energy. Okay, this was explained by Einstein and was the final thing that showed that photons were real. Why? Because there's a relationship between how many electrons you're getting off and this uh, consistent uh, kinetic energy and what kind of photon and what wavelength was striking. And this was the beginning of being able to fire light uh, in photons one at a time and things like that. The, um, oh, that's just what I said. Um, by the way, 16 years later, he, uh, he got a Nobel Prize for this, uh, this work while he was a patent collector um, when it was uh, confirmed experimentally some of his predictions by Robert Milliken. Okay. Now, the atomic structure is also impacted by, the, uh, by this fact and this quantization. Uh, Bohr figured out a model, and it's really based on the fact that um, uh, since, um, because of this quantization of energy, then angular momentum is quantized as well. So that means that even if the electron was a little tiny particle, uh, since it has so little energy, it's affected by this quantization, and it only has certain distances that it can be from the center and be in orbit and be quantized, right? If it's anywhere in between, the energy would be some fraction. So you get these shells. Now, in addition, we find out that the electron acts like a wave in this kind of condition, and so it's actually like a bubble. It's more like the electron is a little bubble. It's sort of 
all over its shell in the superpositional state, but I'm not going to go into superposition today and explain why that's not magic either. Very much a little bit at the end. Um, so the whole shell structure is based on Planck's constant. That's where it comes from. Um, the uncertainty principle. Now, uh, we do a lot of debate. Geez, next to good old Gödel's uh, incompleteness theorem, this is probably one of the most uh, abused, misunderstood, and whined about things in the universe on all sides. But uh, here it is, and you can see it just says that the change in x times the change in the momentum, p is the momentum, has to be greater than or equal to uh, Planck's constant over 4 pi. Okay, so this is why it only affects things in really small amounts. The point is if the delta p is really, really, really tiny, you know, uh, when you multiply it by the delta x, it still has to be greater than this super tiny number of h over 4 pi. Um, but you can see if p is tiny enough in principle, um, that puts a limit on how tiny x can be. So if you're measuring things really, really finely, you have to make a choice between how, if you want to know how much momentum and measure that versus uh, measuring distance. Now you can whine or argue about it all the time. It doesn't really matter. I mean, that's such a small amount. How are you even going to uh, measure that? Um, it's sort of a very important uh, result mathematically. But anyway, I'm showing you effects of uh, the principle. Uh, really, this is another one that is, don't get upset, there's no you know, magic in it. And you can look at it as a measurement limitation. That's a debate that still goes on, though mostly um, you know, it was accepted as a physical limitation. But maybe it's a measurement limitation, whatever, there it is, however you want to explain it. Uh, it has a mathematical derivation, and it's really useful. And of course, um, it makes some sense that it's in that it has Planck's constant because, and the, the whole pi thing is because it has to do with rotational and, uh, uh, anyway, I'm sure Steiser, let Steiser tell you why pi's in there. But anyway, um, you know, uh, it makes some sense when you think that uh, things are gonna be discrete and jumping from state to state. There's going to be, on some scale of time, an uh, inability to know which state it's in. It's gonna switch instantly for you, but it actually takes time, so there's some scale where, of course, you're not going to probe in there. Um, whether it's fundamental in the universe or fundamental to the fact that uh, you have only mortal eyes and whatnot to, to look with. All right. Now, the impact of this on ordinary chemistry, I'm going to say a couple things. One is an emission spectra. It explains this, as I said, and was really where it came from and why it had to explain. Because those other curves that show things going up and down, that's all well and good. But if you get a pure chem, that's how things that have lots of chemicals in them um, behave. But if you um, look at some pure material and heat it up, this is the kind of spectrum you get. You know, If you make hydrogen glow, you get just a few colors there in the visible. Right? If you heat up iron, okay, you get a lot more, but there's still a lot of missing colors. Right? So this is explained by um, the way those electrons jump up and down and the quanta involved there, which are related to the quanta of the colors. So a very specific kind of color can be released by a very specific kind of atom. It's the same thing with absorption spectra. This is a spectra of blue sky, basically, of the sun. The dark lines uh, in the um, transparent spectrum, uh, those are things in the solar atmosphere, chemicals in the solar atmosphere, that are, um, are absorbing some of the light. Um, I have this superimposed the spectra over just a, a graph of the light, so you can see that even though it's just showing the color on the other ones, you know, there is a sort of the black body-ish uh, kind of shape to it. Um, but it has all these deformations. These deformations, the black lines of absorption in this case, are explained by um, by the quantum mechanics that simply falls, follows from the ordinary, uh, if surprising, uh, reality of Planck's constant. I like to go Planck and Planck both times. Finally, uh, the molecular bonds. Because of that whole molecular bond and limiting, this is really the only thing that uh, ever had been figured out to allow chemistry. 
you know, it just didn't really make sense otherwise. But it's through the sharing of electrons and, and the sort of super efficient way the electrons are shared. And here's where you have to bring in a little bit of superposition. We'll get into why superposition is mundane. There's some, you know, things you could do with superposition if you ever pull it off that might be crazy, but there's also limitations why you can't do a lot of those. But an electron orbiting um, a nucleus does get in a superposition and it's spread out. It's like a bubble around that uh, atom, you know, around a hydrogen atom. When it comes up to another hydrogen atom, those bubbles will tend to combine and make this uh, complex interactive bubble. And this is really what holds the uh, atoms together and makes molecules. And it's all because of this discreteness that this kind of interchange can work. If you think about it one way, it's sort of a, it is a mechanistic thing and it works kind of like click, 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 like a computation. And uh, that requires discrete. Turns out continuity uh, doesn't so do so well with those kinds of, uh, uh, those kinds of things. The, 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 con the continuous mathematics of classical mechanics couldn't really understand how this sort of bonding works, even though it knew about all the parts. But once it understood the parts a little bit differently uh, and had this discrete amount, um, some of this stuff became clear. Now, as I said, even if the, the electron was a little magnet, it would have to have those distances to have quantized energy, right? So even if it was like that. But the fact that it acts like a wave, another way of looking at it is um, not that it has to be a certain distance so it's angular velocity. Another way it becomes to look at it is that it's a little wave, right? Well, if a wave is going to go in a circle, you know, it's got to be seamless, you know, like a tile background, you know, you want it to meet at the end. So it has to be, it has to go around the, the, the circle it's making, it has to be um, a whole number of its wavelength. And this is how you start to get some of the discreteness. See, it has to be a whole number because it's going to meet itself. And that's what it's doing, and the electron is spreading out and sort of meeting itself and acting as sort of a bubble. Um, and okay, so it's weird the physics of a bubble, but whoever said it was a magnet in the first place, it's really a bubble the whole time. It acts like a little tiny BB magnet sometimes, but most of the time in molecules, it acts as this little bubble that can connect and repel and interact with the bubbles around other atoms and make all of the chemistry uh, that we know about happen and especially especially chemistry and biology uh, requires um, the really exquisite versatility um, of this process.